the IATF 16949 podcast, where we talk about all things automotive. Find us on our channel at youtube.com slash IATF 16949 auditing, or visit our website at www.iatfglobaloversight.org. This is the IATF 16949 podcast. Welcome to this first IATF 16949 podcast. I'm Paul Hardiman, subject matter expert for SMMT and IOB. In this episode, we'll be talking to Devon Gage, Program Manager at the IOB, and Noel Keeley, IETF Oversight Manager at Society of Motor Manufacture and Traders, about requirements related to the IETF scheme. We'll also be answering some questions from our YouTube channel comments related to this subject. We hope you enjoy this podcast. So, Devon, can you tell us a little bit about the purpose of starting these podcasts? Yeah, so thanks, Paul. Uh, the purpose of this, one, everyone is enjoying the YouTube videos that we have uh, published now for almost three or four years. And there's a lot of questions. We want to answer those questions uh, as well as just bring people general knowledge about the, what's going on at the IETF level, um, if there's any new plans on the future, uh, keep people informed in a kind of informal way as they're traveling wherever they're going to. Um, you know, we're at, we're at a global scheme, so trying to have like a conference or anything like that is very difficult. And we thought that this would be the best way to reach as many people as possible. Yeah, no, great. Now, anything you want to add to that? Well, no, I think just to just to reiterate, it's a kind of hopefully an informal way of us um, like talking about the scheme without necessarily the pressure of having to record a video at the same time. So the as Devin said, the aim is to try and just be an informal um, platform to to talk through what's happening at ITF and hopefully to respond to questions that we get from the videos, but also hopefully just to provide a bit more information about what's happening uh, from an ITF perspective. Yeah, and I certainly think it's great that we're getting so much interest and so many questions from the YouTube uh, auditing channel. And I think these monthly podcasts are going to give us the opportunity to try and answer as many of those questions as we can. So I think that's really the way that we can start it, that we have a number of questions that the, the viewers of the channel have posted against particular videos. So if it's OK with you guys, I think what we'll do is kick off and I will uh, ask some of those questions and you can try and uh, give some insight, give some answers to those. Uh, so, Devon, um, one question is, though I think it's a tremendous step forward that IETF are now publishing data on non-conformities that are raised in IETF audits under the statistics tab of the IETF Global Oversight website. The question that somebody has raised is, is there any plan to break down that data any further? For example, have nonconformities raised per region or number of nonconformities raised by country? Right. So currently, you know, we have our global oversight website and then we have the one that's translated in Chinese and uh, we have that for that region. But as far as breaking it down to all regions across the globe, currently we're not looking at doing that. Um, we're still, obviously, data privacy is one of the hot topics right now. And we want to make sure that any data that we have remains private and we follow all the applicable laws across all the organizations over the world. Yeah, no, I think that that's a fair comment. So I guess it's watch this space on that one. But at the moment, I think it's a great step forward publishing the data um, yeah, on, a global, on a global basis. Yeah. Yeah, one of the questions I had recently on the NC data was it would be great to see the numbers. At the moment, we show the percentage by um, by ITF clause, and, and there was a kind of request that I picked up around, would it be possible to show the the numbers? Um, now, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that, but I thought it was a good question, and, and we will follow up on that. Yeah, good. Uh, second question for you now, then. Um, a re, uh, one of the, the viewers actually expressed that sometimes on the IETF website, 
um, the translations of the SIs and the FAQs, either for the standard itself or for the rules, is not always necessarily at the same level. Um, what are your views on this? And you know, what is IETF as a, as a group trying to do to improve the translation process? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a valid question. And, and I think um, probably since that was posted, we've seen, seen some improvement in um, getting everything published consistently, the FAQs and the sanctioned interpretations. There's no doubt it's a bit complicated, this, because you know, we have around 14 languages that, that everything needs to get translated into. Um, some of the eagle-eyed um, uh, viewers stroke listeners will have maybe noticed there's, there's a bit of small print on the Global Oversight website that now kind of reinforces that the English language version kind of becomes the default until the other languages are published. So there's a little bit of small print just under the FAQs and the SIs that reinforce that message um, but we do our best across the um, global oversight to ensure that translations do get published in a timely way. And it is one of those topics that we do keep um, going back to. Again, Devin, I don't know if you want to chip in on that. No, no, uh, you covered it, Niall. As you said, we tried, um, but obviously if it's not available, always reference the English um, and you can always contact your uh, relevant oversight office if your uh, certification body or auditor or if your stakeholder contact your CB and see if uh, you can find when it'll be released in language. Yeah. Good. Devon, the next uh, question, uh, and it starts with a compliment actually, that um, one person posted that they think that the CARA, the Common Audit Report application, which obviously all third-party IETFs will be familiar with, uh, auditors will be familiar with, but also any IETF certified client will be seeing the CARA reports and being asked to put their corrective actions uh, in through the CARA format. So I think generally the, the uh, community is saying that CARA has been a success. The question is, is there any plans to extend the concept of CARA to things like audit planning. Yeah, so obviously that's something we're glad, one, that we're getting compliments. We, we knew that the CAR application was going to be, once rolled out, uh, extremely beneficial to all stakeholders. But um, yes, we were looking at uh, putting a work group together to kind of um, make that process standard. The more standard process we can have, it just helps our scheme in general. Yeah, and now I think one of the, the, the points raised was that there is a big difference in the format of audit plans that are produced by the different third-party certification bodies. Yeah, have you any comments about that? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. No, I think yeah, Dev, Devin's right, Paul, that um, we are looking at the feasibility, I would say, is probably the way to describe it, of formalising audit planning within CARA is, you know, we all know it's such an important part of the audit to, to undertake that sort of uh, planning activity before the, the audit. And uh, we've got 39 IETF recognised certification bodies and they'll, they'll all have their own um, approach to audit planning. So the, the audit plans will all look a bit different um, Etc. So it is definitely something off the back of the launch of CARA that we are looking at. And a fair bit of work has been done. But unfortunately, at this point, I can't kind of say um, whether it's going to go forward. But it's definitely a, a subject that is being discussed. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I, I, I hope that it that it um, that something might happen. But at the moment, yeah. I can't say anything concrete. Yeah. And I think, you know, it would benefit where there are organizations that have multiple sites around the world that are using different certification bodies yeah. to see a standardized approach, just like we're seeing through CARA. Yeah. So I guess, uh, viewers and listeners, then it's, yeah, watch this space. Yeah. And if there are any developments, we can update you on that in future 
uh, podcast. So now the next question relates to how many third party qualified auditors are there around the world? And in particular, the, the question was related to how many of those auditors are in Europe. And then the second part of the question is, do you, and Devon, do you think there are enough ITF auditors to service the 87 or 88,000 certified ITF clients? That is a great question. Um, so I can tell you kind of in, in total, there's around about 3,300 um, certified auditors globally. Um, and and you know, we, we know how those auditors are, are distributed globally. It, it's always a bit difficult, this, because we, I would say, rely on the certification bodies to... Uh, ensure they have sufficient resources to manage their clients. That's that's not really the job of of the ITF. Our role in this is to make sure that the auditors that are put forward um, for training go through a, a robust training and assessment process. And we like to think we do that. Um, but yeah, difficult to answer whether there are enough auditors. Um, I don't know. Yeah, Devin, I don't know. Is that have you got a yeah no like you said Niall we we rely on our certification bodies they know their business right they know how many orders it's going to take to service the clients that they have now uh, we do uh, look at the scheme and see identify maybe if there's power auditors or you know the people that are auditing plus 275 days a year and you, you kind of wonder maybe they need a few more resources in that region but uh, really we, we let our certification bodies design or um, figure out how many auditors they need because it, that's their business uh, they know it better than we do so yeah, mm-hmm. and just, just back to Europe now, I don't expect you to quote the absolute number, but out of that 3,200 auditors, approximately how many of those will be in Europe? So roughly speaking, um, 25% of, of those auditors will be will be located based in, in Europe. Yeah. Um, obviously, the highest percentage of, of auditors we see in in Asia, but that follows the um, the highest sort of percentage of certified sites. So I think the number of auditors reflects the um, number, yeah, the number of certificates, let's say, of certified sites around the globe. Yeah, and and I guess you know on a, a monthly or annual basis, there are auditors that are leaving the scheme, maybe retiring. Yeah. But I know, and I'm sure you know that there are a lot of new auditors being qualified that are coming into the process. So I think in any scheme like this is always going to be a churn of auditors. But certainly the feedback I get is at the moment there isn't a global shortage of auditors, but there may be a shortage in particular regions of the world. Yeah, and and, and anyone that's interested in in new auditor training, there is a a link from the Global Oversight website, which um, will provide you with um, resources around who does the training, um, where it's done, which languages it's in, and you can make contact with the training providers through the IETF Global Oversight website. Yeah, no, great. No, I think that that certainly answers that listener's uh, question. Devon, just uh, I put myself in the context of this then. If I was a third party ITF 16949 auditor, I've been through the auditor qualification process in the ADP, and I want to either change certification bodies or I want to get multiple sponsorship with more than one certification body. Is that allowed under the scheme? Yeah, so the IATF, uh, as long as you want to go to any of our contracted certification bodies, uh, you can request it through the what's called the ADP. It's the Auditor Development Process. It's a platform out there that um, third-party auditors have access to. You can request to any of the 39 IATF certified um, or contracted certification bodies. However, it really comes down to the specific contract the certification body and the auditor have together. So uh, always check 
with your contracted CB prior to requesting um, other certification bodies? Yeah, yeah, I know there are some certification bodies that they have the requirement that their auditors, even if they're subcontract, don't work for multiple certification bodies. So that's something I guess the auditors have to take into to account uh, in trying to work with different certification bodies. But I think what you're saying is there's no restriction in the rules for auditors working for multiple certification bodies or indeed changing certification bodies. Um, doing their, their their period of qualification, yeah. Paul, it's worth just yeah, well, yeah. On that subject, I know certainly in in China, auditors can only work for one certification body, and and like Devin said, CBs themselves yeah. might have their own um, rules around whether whether they use um, associate resources or not. So it's um, it's on a kind of yeah. it, it depends, I suppose, is the answer, but. As Devin says, the ADP manages the auditor sponsorships, and, and an auditor can uh, request additional sponsorships through the ADP if that's appropriate. And Niall, you 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 do bring up a good point that you have to check with your local uh, government with their laws and regulations as well as your certification body. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that I've learned that then. That's useful to know. Um, now, the next question, we're getting a lot of compliments from, from the listeners and the, the viewers of the YouTube channel. One is saying that they really like now that ITF is formally publishing the certificate numbers and showing the breakdown of the certificate numbers uh, around the world. Um, but the question is, is there any similar information published on ISO 9001 certificates and the global distribution of those and whether the numbers of ISO certificates are going up or whether they're going down? Yeah, that, that, that is a good question. And, and it's in a way, it's difficult for us, Paul. You, you might have a, a, a view on this. We, we know from an ITF point of view at the, at the last count, we were about 88,000 um, certificates globally which puts ITF as what I would call a fairly a fairly large certification scheme, but um, it would be dwarfed by ISO nine thousand and one. I think we're probably talking about a million um, organisations um, or, more. or more. Yeah, so by far and away yeah. the biggest quality management system standard. Um, so ITF in in relation to that is very small. But to be honest, I don't know of a a global central um, repository that, that gives that information. I know national accreditation bodies are, are publishing some certificate information for, for standards like ISO 9001, um, but I, I don't know of a, of a sort of central global figure. Yeah, and I think that the other good thing that people like, I think, is the validity check that you can do for ITF certificates at the ITF Global Oversight website. From my understanding, I don't think there is an equivalent that there is for ISO 9001 where you can go and globally check that a certificate does hold a, uh, a valid accreditation. So that is, I think, managed locally, I think. Yeah, yeah but that is a great point, and you've reminded me. We have that, you'll have seen anyone that uses the certificate validity checker. This is for IATF certified sites. That has recently been enhanced, let's say. Um, so the search criteria has been expanded. We've got within the ITF scheme something called a, a unique site identifier. Uh, so every location, every certificate has a unique number attached to it. So that can be used or the certificate number or uh, the company name can be used. Um, and you get a, a, a more granular ris response from the check. So not only are you seeing yes or no, but you're also seeing, well, is it a suspended certificate? Is it an expired certificate? Is it a withdrawn certificate? So you get some good um, information via that portal so a little advert for the um, validity check from the global oversight website that's certainly a lot more useful i think now i think it used to be you could really only search on the atf certificate number uh, but you couldn't search by the company name for example or the country 
So no, that 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 I agree. Uh, I think is a big enhancement that if somebody wants to check, is it a kosher IETF certificate? Is it, is it a valid certificate? That you can do that from the ITF Global Oversight website. Uh, so, so no, that that that's great. Yeah, and Paul and Niall, I think we might want to point out here um, the equivalent for ISO nine thousand one does not exist. Obviously, there was IAF Cert Search, uh, which you can put a search a company or a certificate number, and if it's in that database, it will return the results. But that database is not mandatory. Um, so there's a lot of uh, certificates that are not in there, but it could be in some cases a good tool for people to use. Yeah, and I think, for example, some accreditation bodies like UCAS, um, they do for their certification bodies for a UCAS accredited certificate. You can go to the UCAS website and and check validity of certificates. So there are, but I don't think I think I agree with you, Devon. There isn't one global database for accredited ISO 9001 certificates. And I, to be honest, I don't think there ever will be because it would be a hell of a task to keep that up to date. Um, but no, good good question by the, by the viewer uh, on that one. Okay. Um, Devon, the next question is again a bit about nonconformities, that if we take the IETF requirement, for, for example, 8.5.1.1, which relates to control plan. And that requirement is almost a full page requirement broken down into sub elements like A, B, C, and D. The question is when we provide the non conformity data, could we not only identify the top 10 clauses, but could we break down into the sub clauses? of some of these bigger clauses. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Currently, we don't have the ability to do that. Um, within what we call the IATF database, where all the certificate information, audit information is stored, uh, we just go to the clause number. We, not, we don't go to the, um, alf to the alphabet. So, uh, so it, you would not see a, a, B, C, or D there. Um, you would only see the top level, the 8.5.1.1. Yeah. Yeah, because the auditors can only put that level of detail, can't they, in CARA and then yeah. from the database. That Yeah. And, and I guess the argument not to go down to the sub-elements is nonconformities are against a system or a process issue they're not just because a shell requirement in 8.5.1.1b has not been met. There would the system problem would be some aspect of the control plans are not effectively developed or the control plans are not effectively implemented. Yeah. And in a way, Paul, we have had these discussions about well, should we go into a, a greater detail of, of level within the within the database? But exactly to your point, really the the system problem is what we're trying to identify to the organisation so that they can address the, the issue around problem solving rather than around a specific part of problem solving. Yeah, good. The next question that was posted then, Niall, is about can an IETF OEM authorised service provider get an IETF certification? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a good question. It, 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 again, it's, un, it's a little bit unclear about what a, an OEM authorised service provider is. It sounds like it could be a, a dealer or... or um, a service centre, maybe. Or yeah. service centre. Um, but, but, yeah, we, we always have to go back to the, the eligibility of value-added manufacturing, um, i.e. making you know, a tangible product that that gets integrated into the vehicle so maintaining the vehicle or selling the vehicle wouldn't wouldn't meet that eligibility uh, criteria so unfortunately unless they're doing value added manufacturing then then no they wouldn't be eligible for IATF certification right okay no that that's clear and again that is defined not in the IETF standard, I guess. That is more linked back to the IETF rules yeah. around the eligibility for IETF. Yeah. 
yeah and I, and I guess I think many of the the uh, viewers and listeners will be aware that the ITF rules are currently going through a revision process. I guess that could be clarified or changed possibly in Rule 6 edition. Yes, and I think what, yeah, it could. I think what will happen in Rule 6 edition is there will be a clarification about what's what's eligible and, and maybe what isn't eligible. We've ended up with I think with rules five, we've added on things to the eligibility that um, over time have been identified and deemed to be integrated into the vehicle, but have been shown as kind of a list of of um, things that are also included. I'm hoping with rule six that it will be a very clear definition of what is in and what and what is excluded. Um, from certification yeah I think that would that will be helpful and it will probably reduce the number of questions yeah. you guys get on a daily basis yeah. about eligibility so I think if we can clarify that that would be great um, and another final general question Devon is about consultants that are working and supporting clients with either implementation of IETF 16949 or helping uh, clients maintain their certification and is there any plan for IETF to have any recognized qualification process for consultants? So no not currently obviously the IETF we concentrate on third-party certification we have a very rigorous process for our auditors um, but to keep the integrity of the scheme we, we draw a very separate line from auditing versus consulting now yes uh, we know that there are many companies out there that do need help and need these consultants, but it's the responsibility of those organizations to, in fact, vet and make sure that the consultant company they go with is adequate for their needs. Yeah, because I guess, now under the ITF and ISO 9001 requirements, the organization has to look at a consultant as an external provider and ensure they're competent. Yeah. And and there's no there's no expectation or requirement or uh, need for organisations to to use consultants in in the way they kind of manage their their QMS their quality management system. Um, but you're right, Paul. If if they are using um, external resource, let's say, then then that should be covered under the. Uh, control of externally provided services yeah yeah and do the due diligence an organization yeah. should do the due diligence if they plan to use a consultant yeah maybe to to check their track record any references um but there is no and from what i hear from you guys there is no plan to have any form of certification scheme for consultants yeah, which no, which I, yeah. no, and what you know, it's worth saying just while we while we talk about the consultant, the word consultants, the ITF are very clear about um, the involvement of consultants during any third party audits. In other words, it, it's not acceptable for a, a consultant to be involved um, or to participate in any way, shape, or form in a third party audit. So, from ITF's point of view. If, if an organization chooses to use a consultant that that's okay uh, but the the QMS must be owned managed understood by the organization they can't rely on um, a, a, a consultant to kind of explain what's happening uh, that that wouldn't be great thank you for listening to this episode if you enjoyed it follow us or visit our YouTube channel to watch more content from us at IETF 16949 Auditing. And don't forget, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments of the relevant video. The IETF 16949 Podcast, where we talk about all things automotive. Find us on our channel at youtube.com slash IETF 16949 Auditing, or visit our website at www.auditing.com iatfglobaloversight.org. This is the IATF 16949 podcast.